Chapter Twenty Two of Twenty Minutes Late by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Two Luck. Christmas Day was one long drawn out delight to the young people. The only mar to the pleasure of the occasion was Rufus Kedwin's ill concealed envy, joined to the often repeated sentence, I never saw anything like the luck you and Line have, Ben Bryant, never i think as much fanny would occasionally add but her thoughts did not dwell on the subject like her brother's what held her to unbounded interest was caroline's dress oh line she said what a perfectly lovely dress that is i never expected to see you in such an elegant rig i am sure i never expected it answered line laughing i don't know what i have done to have these people so good to me it isn't anything that i have done it is just because they are all so lovely themselves they can't help being good to other people did you ever see anybody so sweet as little dorothy and she gave you that watch all with her own money said fanny feasting her eyes upon the dainty little creature which was drawn out for the dozenth time for exhibition she must have lots to spend i suppose they all have lots of money it's easy enough to be generous when you have plenty of money to do with i'd like to give away things myself if i ever had anything to give i never could understand said rufus loftily why some folks should have all the money and other folks all the hard work any more than i can understand why some folks have all the luck and other folks get along the best way they can nobody ever gave me a suit of clothes or ever will fanny will be an old woman before she will have a watch i dare say oh come now said ben don't you keep up all that old croak rufus kedwin i am sure you have had luck how long since you and fanny had tickets sent you to come to philadelphia they are no great things said rufus determined to look on the dark side they didn't cost my uncle a single cent one of the directors of the road gave them to him for something he did this amused both ben and caroline and they laughed merrily what earthly difference does that make asked ben when he could speak again do you calculate the value of your gifts by the money they cost somebody else it makes a great difference to me said rufus gloomily it is easy enough to give things that don't cost anything you don't care who gets them but when it comes to watches and machines that is something like look at that thing of yours now that cost lots of money i'll be bound and you can earn some money with it just as likely as not if i had it i knew i could who do you suppose will ever think of giving me a stenograph and here is line getting music lessons and new dresses and things and living like a princess i tell you it's all luck some portions of this speech were much less polite than they might have been if rufus had been a thoughtful boy it is true caroline's little presents to him and to fanny had not cost a great deal of money but they had cost her a great deal of care and thought and some hours of work and it seemed rather hard to be almost told that they weren't of any consequence however she was used to rufus kedwin ben at the mention of his wonderful and beloved machine fingered the keys lovingly and smiled down upon it this is a great big thing he said i am willing to own it it is the biggest thing i ever had in my life i thought when my pictorial dictionary came i had got to the highest possible notch but i am bound to believe this is a little ahead though i wouldn't say so if that sweet little mouse of a dorothy were here because as you say rufus i can make it earn something for the rest of the folks as well as give pleasure to me but i'll tell you what it is old fellow i offered to teach you the alphabet you know and show you the new-fashioned way of spelling and all that and i'll repeat the offer and teach you how to write on this thing just as soon as i learn myself then two of us will understand it you see rufus eyed it gloomily what good will that do me he said gruffly i haven't any machine and i'm not likely to have i don't see any earthly use in bothering my brains learning how to use it 
if there was any prospect of my ever having one that would be another matter dr forsythe who unknown to the young people was in his reception room which opened from the back parlor now came forward and joined them entering into conversation with caroline's guests in a genial way as he knew well how to do then as he turned to go he laid his hand kindly on rufus's shoulder i overheard some of the things you said my young man he said pleasantly heard your opinions about luck and matters of that kind i am a good deal older than you and naturally know a little more of life and i am inclined to think you will take it kindly if i give you a little advice rufus blushed and stammered something which was intended to be an assent and the doctor continued what a great many people are disposed to call luck is merely a natural working out of circumstances bound to follow almost as a matter of course for instance in regard to these two young friends of yours i heard enough to lead me to understand that in your opinion they have in some respects been lucky if i were to be asked my judgment in the matter i should say no they have been faithful they have done the best they could under the circumstances in which providence has placed them and the natural result has followed our friend caroline is naturally a very grateful little woman and imagines that she has received some wonderful gifts the actual fact is that what she has done and is doing every day of her life for my little daughter could not be paid for in money could not be estimated at a money value the gifts which she has received are only the tokens of our gratitude to her for being at all times and in all places faithful efficient and trustworthy that is a great deal to say of one so young as she but it is due to her that i say that here and now her mother and her friends have reason to be proud of her not that faithfulness is a thing which should be so rare as to win our admiration but i am sorry to say it has been my experience in life that it is very rare to find one who in all things does the best he knows as for ben here there is a sense in which he may be said to have earned his stenograph at least i should never have thought of giving him one if i had not been surprised and interested by hearing that he had set himself to work in an earnest business-like fashion to learn to read its characters at a time when he had not the least idea that he would ever possess a machine and had held so steadily and so successfully to his work that his sister here tells me she has been in the habit for the last few weeks of writing her letters to him on the machine and that his replies have shown that he has had no difficulty in reading the letters that to me showed a degree of perseverance and pluck which seemed worthy of recognition therefore i presented his sister with a machine for his benefit and for mine i have no doubt but that some time in the future he will make me satisfactory copies of valuable work by the aid of this very machine so you see there is an element of selfishness in my plans he said smiling but the thing which i wished you specially to understand was that both benjamin and caroline have brought about by their own force of character the things which seemed to you to have been brought about by a series of happenings and really my dear boy this is a history of most lives as a rule we secure in this world what we work for we reach the heights that we have climbed for and now having preached to you all a little sermon i will invite you to take a ride after making a call on our friend dory joseph will drive wherever you direct and you can have from two to three hours of sightseeing before dinner mrs packard says the baskets are ready caroline and the carriage will be at the door by the time you are all ready for it they found miss perkins in a flutter of delight over the christmas presents which had already reached her having been sent the night before in order that dory might have as early a christmas as any boy in the city the baskets which caroline had in charge had to do with miss perkins's and dory's christmas dinner and caroline knew there wouldn't be a better dinner served in the city than would come out of those same baskets dory who had reached what dr forsythe called the comfortable stage but which to himself was a very restless and uncomfortable period was shyly glad to see them all 
he and caroline were very good friends she having been there several times since the accident but dory's heart went out immediately to ben and the look out of his large eyes was so wistful when they rose to go that ben taking a swift second thought drew caroline aside look here he said suppose you drive on for half an hour without me and let me try to cheer up this little chap he has had a lonesome day so far i guess he's a boy who is used to rampaging around whenever he has a mind and to lie on a bed and keep still with only his aunt to talk to is tremendously hard work i was sick myself once and even with mother and daisy on hand it was as much as i could do to endure it oh but ben said caroline in distressed undertone how can i spare you to-day it's christmas you know and i haven't seen you for so long and i was going to take you a beautiful ride i know it he said cheerily but there is to-morrow and the next day i am not going back until saturday and i only planned for half an hour there will be a good hour and a half after that i think it will be the right thing to do line don't you i suppose so she said with a half laugh but right things are real hard sometimes i feel just as selfish as an owl ben laughed gleefully i don't believe owls are selfish he said you mean the historical piggy don't you miss perkins when she understood the situation was divided between delight and dismay delight that dory was to have a little company all to himself and dismay that ben was to use up part of his christmas ride it is very good of you she said eagerly there isn't a boy in a hundred that would do it or even think of it i am sure of that dory will be delighted ever since he got through looking at his christmas presents he hasn't known what to do with himself poor boy i could go out and get my lovely dinner started if you were here to keep him company but then it is too bad for you to lose your ride as you are here just for a few days with your sister it isn't to be thought of for a moment all right said ben cheerily we won't say anything more about it there is the carriage line get yourself started as quick as possible miss perkins you go out and start that christmas dinner i'm afraid it won't be ready in time dory is going to be famously hungry i know he and i will have the jolliest kind of a time for the next half hour there was no escaping ben's cheery determination to manage the program according to his own fancy even caroline when she saw the look in dory's eyes decided that the sacrifice was worth making and only rufus as he went down the steps grumbled in undertone to fanny ben bryant wouldn't be happy if he couldn't manage everything and everybody well he's a real nice manager said fanny to plan for other people and not for himself most always a great deal can be said in a half hour poor dory hadn't been so heartened up as miss perkins called it since the accident for one thing it was a great relief to tell somebody all about it in his own way a boy who would be interested in all the particulars and ask all the questions and give him a chance to prove that he wasn't doing anything so very dreadfully out of the way but was actually being a very helpful personage when the accident happened she thinks i ought never to go near a fire he said twisting his head restlessly on the pillow and for that matter that i oughtn't to cross a street when there was a horse within a mile either way and i oughtn't to get on to a street car till it has stood five minutes stock still the fact is that there aren't many things that a fellow can do according to her notions ben laughed merrily i can guess how it is he said in a sympathetic tone she is a woman and women are not used to being out in the street where the crowds are and they oughtn't to be i know all about it my father has been dead for a good many years and i have had my mother to think about and to take care of just as you have your aunt one of the ways i have of taking care of her which helps her more than anything i can do i believe yet a while is keeping her from worrying you know by letting her understand that there are certain things i won't do 
i go an eighth of a mile out of my way every day of my life just to avoid crossing the railroad at a certain point where my mother thinks it's dangerous it isn't you know any more than it is at any other point but mother thinks so and she can't help it and as i have her to take care of why of course i save her worrying about that there must be as many as a dozen things that i do or don't do just for the sake of saving mother she likes it and it doesn't hurt me and it's about as good a way as any to help along new lessons these for dory miss perkins will have reason to bless the hour when ben bryant gave up his ride in the handsome carriage and stayed to visit with her boy so he had his aunt to look after and take care of had he such an idea had never entered his busy restless little brain before that he should cease jumping off street cars when they were in motion or running across the roads directly under horses feet or walking down town on the railroad track in order to help take care of his aunt was an entirely new idea up to this point if he thought anything about it he would have supposed that his mission in life was to worry his aunt that is he had imagined that if he failed to do any of these manly things he would be a baby instead of a boy here was a great tall fellow talking in a business-like way about taking care of his mother and actually giving up his own ways and taking extra steps and a great deal of trouble just so she wouldn't be worried when there was nothing to be worried about you are a kind of a queer chap he said eyeing ben reflectively say honor bright ain't you different from other fellows ben laughed merrily i don't know about that he said i'll tell you what i do think though that i have better times than most folks i don't know of another boy of my age who has as downright good a time as i do i didn't used to think so i used to growl a good deal because i hadn't money and couldn't go to school and couldn't do forty other things that i wanted to but things are changed with me i'll tell you what said dory emphatically i think you are queer do you really work every single evening either for the man you are working for or else studying at home every evening but thursday said ben on thursdays i don't do a great deal of studying i am later at the office than i am on other days and i get home just in time to eat my supper and dress for prayer meeting and after we come home from prayer meeting there is almost always a letter from my sister to read then we talk it over and have good times together and i have sort of given up the idea of studying thursday night and have made a pleasure evening of it a pleasure evening repeated dory almost a contemptuous note in his voice i told you you were queer i suppose you like going to prayer meeting too yes said ben gravely i like it not as well as i might under some circumstances they don't appear to me to know how to manage a prayer meeting in the church that i go to in a way to interest young folks a great deal but then i should go all the same if i didn't like it even as well as i do i am not such a baby i hope as not to be able to go to a prayer meeting once a week because some of the talk they give is dull and some of it is beyond me so that i can't understand it if i couldn't understand a dozen words they said i should hope i would have sense enough to go i don't see why what's the use in a fellow going where he doesn't understand anything and doesn't enjoy it oh well there are some things to enjoy dory i haven't in a good while listened to a prayer that hadn't a great deal in it for me and i like the singing first rate and the words of the hymns i like you see my boy i belong to the family and it is a kind of family gathering that we have once a week some of the aunts and uncles and cousins i like better than others but i have a kind of general interest in them all and don't want to be away when the time comes for the family gathering don't you know how it would be going out to a christmas dinner there might be two or three cousins that you wouldn't like very well and maybe an uncle or so who wasn't exactly to your mind but after all it would be the christmas gathering of the relations and you wouldn't like to be counted out i'd go there for the dinner said dory with a laugh no you wouldn't 
if they sent you the same kind of dinner exactly and you had to eat it on the corner of the table at home alone you wouldn't like it half so well i don't know what you are talking about anyhow said dory a christmas dinner and a prayer meeting are two different things that's so said ben gravely i'll tell you what i mean dory i'm a servant of jesus christ and i like to go where he is talked about and where people gather who are in the same service we are soldiers you see and he is our captain if you belong you understand it and if you don't why you don't dory's head was turning restlessly on his pillow again the conversation was getting too grave for him ben hastened to change it do you like machines he asked briskly i've got a new one a christmas present the cutest thing out a stenograph did you ever see it never heard of it said dory promptly what is it for to write with it makes five little dashes all exactly alike and yet you can read them after you have learned how just as you can read another language you know that's nice said dory interested at once i always thought it would be fun to know some language that other folks didn't so did i said ben and it is great fun that is one reason i like latin so well this stenograph is a big thing it is a shorthand writer you know when you have learned how you can write down what a speaker says every word of it and take notes at the office and do all sorts of work with it i expect to earn money with mine i'd like to see it said dory his face aglow with interest i always did like machines first rate i used to think i could make one if i had a chance one of these days i'm going to try good said ben i understand that i have had just such notions myself why wouldn't it be a good scheme for you to learn to read the stenograph while you are lying here on your back i learned the alphabet and all about it before i ever saw a machine my sister line saw the one that they use at dr forsythe's and she sent me a slip of paper that had almost all the letters on it that's the way i learned if i were you i'd pitch in and learn it lying here it would be great fun then when i go home i'll write you letters on my machine you can read them and nobody else can all right said dory with more energy than he had used since he had been sick i'd like that first rate is it hard to learn oh it takes pluck and patience said ben a little chap that hasn't much in him wouldn't learn it he'd give it up tired out before he'd got halfway through the alphabet but of course you won't no dory wouldn't after that speech ben fumbled in his pocket and brought out a little roll of stenograph paper such as he was pretty sure to have about him here he said are a couple of bible verses that line sent me to learn to read on they are real good because they have so many of the letters in them the verses are written on the stenograph you understand and i copied them on this card from my sister line's letter and carried the card around with me in my vest pocket for weeks before i was sure of every letter i'll leave them all with you and day after tomorrow i'll come again if i can and see how you've got along the carriage has come for me now and i'll have to go you'll bring the machine with you when you come won't you said dory wistfully and receiving a hearty promise that this should be done ben took his departure the verses on the card were especially calculated to teach a lesson to a boy like dory these were the words be not wise in thine own eyes fear the lord and depart from evil in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths end of chapter 22「chapter 23 of 20 minutes late by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 23 another side track ben's brief holiday sped away he and rufus and fanny went home school duties commenced again and all things were as before no not quite as before 
rufus and fanny had learned some lessons of life which they were not likely to forget they had discovered that a girl could be honestly earning her own living and yet be as highly thought of by those whose opinion was worth having as though she were doing nothing ben had his beloved stenograph and worked at every leisure moment with such purpose that before spring he had a triumph at the office one afternoon he found mr wellborn very much annoyed i don't know what i'm going to do said that gentleman impatiently here's harris sent word that he is sick and cannot copy these notes of his and there isn't a person in town so far as i know who can do it for him mr wellborn was not talking to ben but to his junior partner but ben had turned at the first sound of mr harris's name giving a keen glance at the notes to be copied as he suspected they were stenograph notes as soon as he had finished distributing the letters which he had in his hand into their proper places he came toward mr wellborn i beg your pardon he said hesitatingly but if there isn't anybody else i think i could copy those notes for you you said mr wellborn with a smile i know you are a most accommodating chap but i'm afraid these notes will be too much for you they are on a shorthand machine i know it said ben i have seen mr harris work i can read the stenograph you can how long since where did you learn i learned early in the winter my sister who is in philadelphia sent me the alphabet and the manual and i learned how to read it before i ever saw a machine then at christmas time i had a present of one and have been writing on it ever since the mischief you have and i never knew anything about it can you take down letters at dictation i think i can sir mother has dictated a great many to me for practice and i have written them out afterwards and got every word glad to hear it said mr wellborn complacently harris is sick oftener than i have any patience with the trouble is he is sick of the business and wants to get out do set to work on these notes then they are important ones and if you can make a fair copy and can take dictations i can afford to give you pleasanter employment and better pay than i have been doing a boy does not work industriously on a stenograph for three months for nothing the notes were almost as easily read by ben as though they had been in print by nine o'clock that evening he was able to give an excellent typewritten copy of them to the gratified lawyer from that time business was brisk for ben bryant and the work was such as delighted his heart and in itself was no small education for mr wellborn's notes were dictated in choice english and were on important subjects he made a prompt advance in ben's wages such a surprising advance as caused great rejoicing at home and some grumbling on the part of rufus in regard to people who are always in luck with caroline the time sped away on swift wings so busy was she with her studies and with her loving care of dorothy so happy and proud was she with mrs forsythe's increasing interest in her and pleasure in her ministrations so glad was she as the weeks flew on over the near prospect of home once more that she was the only one in the household perhaps who did not realize dr forsythe's increasing gravity and notice the tender almost pathetic gaze which he sometimes fixed on dorothy's fair face it did trouble caroline sometimes to think that dorothy seemed not so strong as she was in the fall but it is the spring days she said to herself nobody feels as strong i suppose at least nobody who is not real well i am sure i feel as strong as ever i did in my life but of course dorothy could not be expected to april passed swiftly and may followed in its train and the days of june were speeding so fast that examinations were just at the door and caroline had had her trunk brought from the storeroom and was beginning to put in packages preparatory to the home going just to think she had begun to say to herself that i shall really see mother and ben and daisy in a few days more then one evening after school 
Dr. Forsythe called her as she was passing his office door. He was alone, and as he closed the door and sat down in front of the seat to which he had motioned her, his kind face was graver than usual. "'I have something to say to you, Caroline, which I have been putting off for several days, weeks indeed, because I feared you might not like to hear it.' Caroline, startled, wondering, yet managed to say that she should hardly think it possible that Dr. Forsythe could say anything that she did not like. He smiled in reply, a grave, sad smile, and then spoke hurriedly. You cannot in the nature of things be expected to like it, and I have been in a great doubt whether to speak it or not, but I have finally resolved to make the effort. I will not keep you in suspense. The plain, sad truth is, Caroline, that our little daughter is failing. We cannot have her with us long. It is increasingly apparent to me every day. You know we are planning for the seaside, and hope something from the sea air, but not very much after all, so far as she is concerned. Can you guess what I am about to say? Can you imagine how her father and mother shrink from separating her from the young friend who has been so constantly with her during this long winter, and been to her such a comfort and help? Neither she nor we can ever forget. If you could find it in your heart, Caroline, to give up home and mother, and go to the seashore with us, I do not say it would prolong our daughter's life, but I cannot help seeing that it would make the days she spends with us brighter, happier. At the same time, I know it is a great thing to ask. I know what it must have been to you to have been so long away from your mother. I know, better than you may imagine I do, the sacrifice it is to give up mother. I do not ask it of you. Mrs. Forsythe does not. Glad as she would be to give Dorothy this additional pleasure, she shrank from the thought of making the request. I have not written to your mother, of course. It is only very lately that I decided to speak at all, and I will not now say anything to her until you have come to a decision. We must go next week. It ought to have been sooner, but Dorothy's heart is so set upon being present at the closing exercises of the public school that I do not like to disappoint her. I leave the matter with you to think about. Remember, we realize how much we ask, and we shall not feel that you have done wrong, indeed, will not feel hurt at all, if you decide that you cannot really give up mother and home this summer and go with us. Try to think as quickly as you can, and let me hear tomorrow, if possible, what your impressions are. He hurried through the last sentence, because somebody was already tapping at the door. With a bow and smile to Caroline, he answered the summons. Poor Caroline need not have waited until the next day to give her answer. She knew before he had completed his sentence what she must decide to do. It made her heart almost stop beating to think of being all the long summer without seeing mother. But at the same instant came the terror of the thought, what if she should never see Dorothy again? Could it be possible that her father thought that she would not live longer than this one summer? Perhaps it was not strange that the first thing this girl far away from home did, when she reached her room, was to lock the door, throw herself on the bed, bury her head in the pillows, and burst into a perfect passion of tears. It seemed to her that from any point of view there was enough to cry for. It was nearly an hour afterwards that she stood brushing her hair before the mirror, having bathed her eyes with the hottest water she could endure. In a few minutes the dinner bell would ring, and she must go down and meet them all, and they would know that she had been crying, and Dr. Forsythe would know the reason. She was sorry for that. She would not trust herself to talk to him, but had resolved to write him a little note that very night. There is no use in waiting, she said aloud, to see how the words would sound. I am not to go home, I know I am not. It is the right way to do, mother will think, and so will Ben, and even poor little Daisy. After all they have done for me, and after the way Dorothy loves me, it would be just cruel not to give her what she wants. I know mother will think I ought to stay with her all summer. 
i may just as well write the note to-night as to wait until to-morrow morning because i am sure what it is right to do therefore the note was written in caroline's best hand very brief and to the point dear dr forsythe i will go with dorothy if my mother thinks best and i am almost sure she will i will write to her to-night and please do not think it makes me feel very badly i love dorothy so much that it would be hard to be away from her matters shaped themselves exactly as caroline had expected they would the letter home was written and the bryant family held a solemn convention over its contents none of them was as much excited and startled as they had been over their disappointment in the fall after the second reading of the letter they all sat quiet for some minutes then mrs bryant said inquiringly with a sad little smile well children well said ben heaving a long-drawn sigh i suppose it's the right thing to do mother isn't it that poor little dorothy what does our daisy say asked mrs bryant tenderly daisy's face was grave her hands were clasped in her lap and her eyes had a far-away sorrowful look mother she said at last her lips quivering but her voice low and composed i love my line and i want her very much but if that little dorothy is going to heaven pretty soon she ought to have line i think this summer perhaps she needs her to help her get ready so the question was settled and caroline's trunk instead of being packed for home was packed for the seaside with all sorts of new and dainty summer things such as she was sure would have driven fanny kedwin half frantic with envy and one summer day she took that long planned journey on the cars not a very long journey for the sea-coast which dr forsythe chose was but a few hours ride from philadelphia but long enough for caroline to realize the sharp contrast between herself as a traveller now and eight months before in the first place it was a very different car which they occupied a drawing-room car dorothy called it with easy chairs and sofas and a private room at one end where a luxurious bed was made up for mrs forsythe it is not my intention to tell you much about that summer at the seaside it was a very full bright summer and despite the shadow which hung low over the household there were some sweet glad days dorothy rallied a little under the influence of the sea breeze and took what were for her long walks to the beach and liked nothing better than to sit in the sand with caroline beside her watchful over the wraps and the sun umbrella that it was at exactly the right angle to shade her from the sun's glare and watch the bathers as they rose gaily over the tops of the waves or the never-ceasing tide as it came rolling in at intervals caroline left her and wandered along the beach to bring beautiful shells and delicate stones pearly tinted blue and amber long quiet restful days they were when dorothy seemed at peace with all the world the only trouble she had being the one which she often put into words i am so sorry caroline dear that you have to be away from your mother and daisy and ben all summer but you will go to them in the fall and have a nice long vacation this was the utmost caroline ever allowed her to say about the sacrifice and was quick to assure her with kisses and caresses that she was having a lovely time that she had never seen the sea before and had always wanted to and that she wouldn't be away from her dear little dorothy these summer days for anything and that mother and daisy and ben felt so too then dorothy would smile her sweet fair smile and say gently you are all good to me everybody always was it is a very sweet world caroline and sometimes i try to think how heaven can be any sweeter if jesus were not there it could not be but the best of it is he is there isn't he caroline do you sometimes feel in a hurry to see him caroline awe-stricken could only confess that she never had felt that way she supposed it was because she was always well and never had a tired feeling then she would bring a new shell or a stone 
and try to turn Dorothy's thoughts away from the grave subject. So the days moved on. "'I think she is better,' said Caroline one evening, in answer to Dr. Forsythe's quick, questioning look. It was Saturday evening, and he had come up from the city to spend a Sabbath with his family. Caroline, according to her custom, had gone to the station to meet him, in order that he might have the earliest possible news of Dorothy. "'I really think, Dr. Forsythe, that she is stronger than she was. Her appetite has been better, and she looks more like herself for a few days than she has since we have been here. But she has been in a great hurry to see you. She has asked two or three times to-day if we felt pretty sure that nothing would hinder you from coming.' "'I had hard work to get away.' he said gravely, but I felt impressed that I must come to-night. "'Dr. Forsythe,' said Caroline earnestly, as they walked up the street together, "'don't you think, perhaps, now that the very warm weather is over, and the pleasant September days are coming, that Dorothy may grow stronger and be real well again this winter?' Dr. Forsythe smiled, that tender, grave smile which she had learned to know so well. We never can be sure, he said quietly. With a disease like hers, we never can be sure just when the end will come. But I have seen nothing this summer to encourage me thus far. It was a very quiet Sabbath. Dr. Forsythe did not go to church, as had been his custom every Sabbath during the season, but had stayed with his wife and Dorothy, sending Caroline and the grandmother away by themselves. It was noticeable that Dorothy talked to her father this time even more than usual, and seemed not to be quite happy when he was out of her sight. Yet the day passed very peacefully, and on Monday morning Dorothy certainly seemed, as Caroline had said, stronger than she had for weeks. "'I believe the child is getting better,' said the grandmother with decision. "'Her face is less pallid than it was,' and this morning she really has a little color. I felt sure the seaside would do her good. Can't you see she is improved, doctor? You are always so despondent, so inclined to look on the dark side. The doctor smiled. Am I? he said. I have need to find a bright side, if there is one, surely. She is all we have, mother. To Dorothy's eager question as to whether her father might take the early train, and whether he was sure that he could plan to come down on Saturday just a little earlier than usual, so that they might have a visit together on the beach before sunset, he answered, with a smile that he tried to make bright and cheery, "'We needn't discuss those points today, Dorothy. I'm going to take a vacation and stay over. I arranged with Dr. Boydner to look after my patients, and assured him that for the one working day of the 365, I was to be at leisure, and give myself to the delights of my family. Dorothy, I have brought with me a new toy that I think you will enjoy. It was brought up from the station Saturday evening, after you and Caroline had retired, and it is in my private room, all ready for exhibition. Come to me as soon as you have had your breakfast, and I promise you a delightful entertainment. End of chapter 23「Chapter Twenty Four of Twenty Minutes Late by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Four At Last. The new toy was nothing more nor less than a phonograph, a machine in which Dr. Forsythe had been deeply interested for some time, and whose mechanical workings he had studied with great care. He now took the deepest interest in explaining in detail, both to Dorothy and Caroline, the practical working of this wonderful little instrument, then unlocked its gate, put in a cylinder, turned on the power, and called upon Dorothy to talk to it. "'What shall I say, Papa?' she asked, a pretty pink flush of excitement on her fair cheek. "'Say anything you please, daughter. Speak in your natural tone of voice, just as though you were talking to me, and use any words you please. You can talk to Mama if you choose, or to Grandmother or Caroline. It will take down every word you utter. Sure enough it did, 
and was an object of absorbing interest to dorothy all the morning cylinder after cylinder was placed at intervals during the day and she was permitted to talk to them to sing in her sweet clear voice one of her favorite hymns to recite a poem of which both she and her mother were especially fond and to say all manner of loving words it was noticeable that dr forsythe though he had explained the economy of the invention by showing them how to pair a cylinder after it had once been used and copied so that it might be used again and again even to the number of seventy times or more would carefully set away in a box on an upper shelf every one to which dorothy had spoken with directions that they on no account be disturbed to the astonishment and delight of his daughter dr forsythe announced the next morning that he intended to take another play day i feel a year or two younger on account of this one he said smilingly and i have telegraphed dr boydner that he need not expect me to-day he said i would become so fascinated with the phonograph that i wouldn't be able to tear myself away so he will understand at least one of my reasons another long bright day full of interest and satisfaction to dorothy was spent by the little family of which caroline seemed to herself to have become a part mrs forsythe whom the sea breezes had really improved was able to rest on the couch in the doctor's room and enjoy with them the talking machine as dorothy had named it which did not in the least lose its charm later in the day after the mother had been carried in her husband's strong arms to her own room for a rest dorothy and caroline were alone together dorothy had been lying back among the pillows resting also suddenly she roused herself and looked toward the phonograph caroline put a cylinder in the talking machine please i want to talk a letter to papa and mamma i know why papa doesn't want any of those up on the shelf paired he wants to keep his little dorothy's voice to talk to him next winter isn't it nice that he can now i will talk a letter to him and mamma that they will not know anything about until some day you will tell them and it will please them very much caroline had no words to answer silently she fitted the cylinder into the machine pushed up the chair for dorothy arranged the pillow at her back turned on the power and stood waiting to see what she was to do next now said dorothy smiling up at her would you just please to go to the other room and leave me all alone a little while i want to talk some words to papa and mamma just for them you know they are good-bye words caroline that i don't know how to say to them because it makes them feel badly but some day they will like to put the cylinder in this machine and hear it say the words in my own voice tears were choking caroline's voice so that she could not answer except by kisses which she left on the two fair cheeks as she moved softly away she waited at the door outside for dorothy's call and presently it came i've finished it said dorothy in a tone of intense satisfaction a nice long talk put it away caroline on the very top shelf and put a little slip of paper inside marked dorothy's talk to papa and mamma i've said some sweet good-bye words to them it is very nice i am so glad papa brought the phonograph down to me so that i could talk to it for them i meant to write a little letter but this is a great deal nicer isn't it caroline because they can hear my voice say the words now let us go to mamma's room and see the sunset there will be a lovely sunset tonight i think those clouds over there are beginning to reflect it already in a few moments more she was cosily settled on a couch in her mother's room her head resting on the pillow beside her mother's one hand clasped in her father's and her face turned toward the glowing west it was a wonderful sunset unlike any which caroline had ever remembered before they talked about it for a few minutes called one another's attention to the lovely gold the glowing crimson with its background of violet shading into even darker hues and the clouds took strange shapes like castles and towers burnished with gold there's a door said dorothy suddenly her eyes fixed on the glory 
the door of heaven and it is wide open it looks as though there were angels standing in the door beckoning do you see them papa look mamma look caroline angels and angels ever so many of them right in the door and all about it ah there they have gone and the door is shut she was still again they were all very still a strange hush seemed to have fallen upon them broken first by the sound of a stifled sob for grandmother was crying a moment more and dr forsythe arose turned on the gas which had been but a faint glimmer and bent over dorothy she lay just as she had when the twilight began face close to her mother's on the pillow one hand clasped in hers but dr forsythe bending low till his lips touched hers said tremulously our darling has gone in and the door is shut there was a sad journey back to philadelphia carrying with them the precious body whose soul went home in that twilight when to her the doors of heaven seemed to open and the angels came to meet her those had been sad anxious days which followed mrs forsythe shocked by the blow with which all her preparation had at last come suddenly for a few days sank rapidly and it seemed for a time as though she too was going away but she rallied and tried bravely to take nourishing food and to sleep and rest and not wear out her heart with weeping i must not go yet she said to caroline with a faint smile it would be too hard for the doctor he cannot spare dorothy and me both at once dorothy would want me to stay and comfort him i must try to grow strong once during those trying days had dr forsythe paused in his busy anxious life to lay a kind hand on caroline's shoulder and say earnestly child you are a comfort to us i hardly see how we could have gone without you it will be a blessed memory to us always that you were with our little girl to the last moment went to the very door with her we can never forget it caroline you have a blessed mother i know and no one must step in and take her place but next to her my child think of dorothy's father and mother as your own you will always be to us a dear older daughter for your own sake as well as for the sake of the one you loved we shall delight to plan for you as if you were indeed our very own mrs forsythe said it differently caroline was one evening arranging the pillows just as some way she had a talent for doing and dorothy's mother reached up put a fair arm around her neck drew her head close down to the pillow and said dear little girl dorothy's caroline and my caroline love us for her sake won't you you must go home very soon that is right of course it is hard to have kept you so long but when you have had a good long rest and visit come back to us dear think of your school duties and home life with us pet me instead of dorothy dear i need it we cannot try to get along without you and i am glad there is no need for you should be in school and there are no better ones than we can offer you at last the morning came and the hour and the moment when caroline bryant was actually seated in the philadelphia train on her way home whirling over the road which she had travelled a desolate little girl so many months before how different everything looked to her how utterly different everything was she thought of that forlorn little girl in a torn soiled dress that had done duty all day in the woods in a pair of heavy shoes much the worse for wear gloveless and without wraps or baggage of any sort what a different picture was the trim maiden who occupied a seat in the parlor car clothed from head to foot in the most becoming and appropriate of traveling costumes hat and gloves and all her belongings matching exquisitely and at her side a modern traveling bag carefully stocked with every convenience that a young traveler could possibly need conductor brinker made many stops at her seat opened her window for her or closed it drew down the shade or put it up as occasion suggested and did everything he could think of for her comfort but there was a respectful air about it all an air of deference such as he showed to ladies 
he even called her miss when he brought her some bright flowers which she had caught sight of by the roadside and admired caroline smiled and answered promptly i am just caroline mr brinker don't call me anything else here is a paper of bonbons which i wish you would take to daisy and bobby i was going around to say good-bye and leave them but i hadn't time so i thought i would bring them along and give them to you great was conductor brinker's pleasure at this bobby would be tickled to death he declared he remembered her of course he did he talked about her for days after the last time she was there and daisy was very well getting to be a right good smart girl her father said goes to school regular as clockwork means to grow up a smart lady like her caroline and he smiled broadly as the day wore away and the train neared the familiar station which meant home and mother and ben and little daisy to this homesick heart caroline had much to do to maintain her dignity she felt at times as though she must tell all the passengers her story how she had gone to philadelphia oh ever and ever so long ago without any intention on her part and stayed without any expectation of doing so and been sidetracked a great many times when she was about to start for home but now she was really and truly within three miles of home however she did nothing of the kind but sat erect with her cheeks growing pinker and pinker and looked steadily out of the window they passed the junction which had caused her so much trouble without so much as a halt the sun was set and the street lamps were being lighted as they rolled into the station at last she was home outside were mother and ben and daisy and mr holden and mrs kedwin and fanny and rufus she could see them every one even before the train stopped she tapped on the window and fluttered her handkerchief and ben caught a glimpse of it before she could make her way to the platform he was beside her what a homecoming was that my darling said mrs bryant folding both her arms about her and giving her such a long long kiss that daisy felt as though her turn were never coming my darling we have you indeed why line bryant said fanny kedwin how you are rigged up dear me i should think you were going to a party but caroline was being smothered in daisy's arms hearing her soft tremulous voice murmur my line and had no ears for fanny kedwin they came over that evening fanny and rufus with their mother the children had to come said mrs kedwin i told them they ought to stay away one night and give you a chance to visit with your folks but they were that crazy to see you that they couldn't give it up my sakes line but you have grown into a fine lady sure enough fine feathers make fine birds that's a fact they have got good taste i'll say that for them and you are a pretty girl anyhow clothes look well on you caroline laughed and blushed while ben gravely gave it as his opinion that clothes looked pretty well on most people are you going back there asked fanny a little later as caroline obliged herself to go away from her mother's side and sit down by the young folks for a little talk say line ben says you are going back there are you yes said caroline i am going back to school the schools are splendid there you know and i am to go through complete my education and graduate if i want to oh my sakes said fanny what luck i think as much said rufus say you folks do you know that it is exactly a year ago to-day that we went nutting that's a fact said ben considering for a moment line it took you a whole year to get home from a nutting excursion just think of it and only think of all the things that have happened since said rufus i tell you what it is line bryant i am the one to be thanked for all your feathers ruffles and watches and i don't know what not if it hadn't been for me going off that night leaving you asleep and all that it wouldn't any of it ever have happened i never thought of that before all the good luck you have had this year has come through me you were never willing to take the blame before said ben laughing 
if you hadn't put her on the wrong train the going to sleep wouldn't have done any harm but never mind it's all over now she's got back if it has taken her a long time to do it caroline's smile came through a mist of tears she could not talk so glibly of all that had happened as they could the year had been full of blessing to her and it seemed to her that she could never be grateful enough for having known and loved her dorothy but the pain of parting from her and of doing without her was too recent for her to be able to laugh and talk cheerily of all the happenings of that year i suppose they gave you lots of things said fanny not being able to get away from the practical part of the matter is that your best dress you travelled in oh my sakes a nicer one than that well they spent lots of money on you that's a fact caroline was silent and half indignant how rude and unrefined and almost coarse this old friend of hers had grown the year seemed not to have changed her in the least for the better she had had in mind to tell them about the beautiful soft white dresses and blue dresses and wraps and hats which with loving thoughtfulness mrs forsythe had sent to daisy they are all my dorothy's things she had said when she took the key of the large trunk from under her pillow and handed it to caroline they will just fit your daisy i cannot have them lie and grow yellow and creased and moth-eaten perhaps because my darling has gone to heaven and will need them no more i would a great deal rather daisy had them besides she wanted it so she sent them to daisy herself that was one of the messages in her letter caroline caroline had thought to tell about the letter given to the talking machine and to describe some of the pretty things in the trunk and tell them how sweet dorothy had looked in them but fanny's sordid views and disagreeable ways of talking closed her lips she felt sure that they would not understand you are great folks for luck said rufus with a sigh i always said so and if this year doesn't prove it i don't know what does to think that because that train was twenty minutes late all this should have happened End of chapter twenty four end of twenty minutes late by pansy recording by tricia g thanks for listening